All right, gang, here we go. This is for Physics Unit 8, Part 7. We're talking about lens applications. So fun. Okay, so last unit or last part here, we talked about lenses and we talked about how to decide, uh, you know, their focal point where the image and the object appear. We talked about ray diagrams. We talked about uh, magnification and what all the symbols mean for the thin lens equation and magnification. Lots of important stuff here. And so now we're going to talk about, well, what does all this mean for like actual practical applications? As you've probably guessed uh, in your life, you've noticed there's lots of lenses and lots of applications for lenses. So we're just just going to talk about a few of those right now okay um so light so this is uh for light this is using glasses and contacts to uh change uh vision okay and so in a far-sighted person okay uh light that travels from whatever source it's looking at okay um, and it comes near and this so this would be something that uh, where it's near right far-sighted means they can't see things that are close up so something that's close up will come and bounce off the lens right here and then when it does so it gets projected so the focal point of the lens is too far away okay and so in order to fix this they use a converging lens Okay, that brings this part uh, forward towards the back of the eye. And so once it ap appears right here, it'll get hit those rods and cones, and then um, it can be you know, transmitted up the optic nerve. Okay, and so lenses or your eye lens on its own right here have these little muscles that will actually adjust uh, the thickness of that lens to adjust that focal point. And so, but if you have hyper hyper hyperopia, Okay, then uh, what exactly happens is that those muscles don't quite work right. I'm not a, an eye doctor, an optometrist, if you will. But um, so that's that's what's going on there. Many people, okay, uh, so farsighted isn't super common, but uh, nearsighted is very common, okay? So there's people with myopia, all right? Uh, and these are people that can't see objects that are very distant clearly. So that's me, okay? Um, I can't see things that are nearsighted, very, or I can't see things that are far away. I'm pretty blind out, without my glasses. Okay, so anyway, so something that's far, far away, so notice that these lines coming in are practically parallel. And uh, But when they come in, they get focused, and your eye accidentally focuses it uh, too far away from the back of the eye, or too you know too far into the eye, so this focal point is not hitting once again. And so by using a diverging lens, notice that right here you can actually see when it hits this diverging lens, it kind of gets spread out, okay? And so then when your eye focuses it, it focuses it back there in the eye, okay? Okay, um, and so uh, you know the, this is not uh, this is more natural in like uh, you know young middle aged people, and then old people kind of tend to go the other way, and that's because their lens becomes inflexible with age, and so it can't be made thicker to focus on these nearby objects. The cl closer you want to look, the thicker that lens has to be in order to bend that uh, thing in just the right way. All right, bend those rays. Okay, uh, so specifically, here's near sighted. We just kind of talked about it uh, just a second ago, and so here's here's these rays. They come in, okay, and so you'd use a diverging lens to fix that. Same thing here with the far sighted. You'd have a you know a, a converging lens in order to fix that. Okay, now we can combine these lenses. All right, so this is where life gets really exciting, and we're going to talk about two specific applications. This right here is if you're focusing on uh, this. Um, specifically, if you're focusing on this, would be like how a, a microscope works. Okay, um, and so uh, so a microscope. So this is known as the objective lens right here. Okay, and this would be the eyepiece lens. All right. And so the object, this green arrow right here, this is what we're looking at. Notice this is very tiny, and it's outside. It's between f and 2f. 2f would be somewhere out here. Okay, it's between f and why did I write an e? 2f. Okay, <laughs> and so your uh, your object is somewhere here, and so we've drawn our rays, the parallel, and then it goes through here, through the focal point, and the focal point, this would be our FO on the other side, right, because lenses have the focal point on both sides, and then the central ray goes straight through, and then we could even draw the other one that would go through this focal point and come off parallel, but we don't really need it, and so our image for this object, for the objective lens, will get formed here. Now the eyepiece that you're looking through, because the image that's formed appears between the focal point and the eyepiece, this would be create an imaginary image, or a virtual image, excuse me. This creates a virtual image, okay, that your eye can see, and your eye would see it past 
the uh, 2f really, really enlarged. Okay, so we're kind of using these two things in conjunction with one another in order to form the image that we want to see. All right, so this is image one formed by object one. Okay, and so we're going to watch both of these real quick, and this will give us a good idea of what's going on. Um, these are from the textbook, from our textbook. Okay, and we're going to watch both of these. The arrangement of lenses in a refracting telescope allows distant things to be magnified. The lens of a refracting telescope furthest from the eye is called the objective. The object being examined is at an effectively infinite distance. The focal point of the objective is closer to the eyepiece than the focal point of the eyepiece. This causes a real image to appear very close to where the eyepiece is. The magnification power of the eyepiece causes a much larger virtual image to form. This allows distant objects to be observed in detail. Okay, and so we notice uh, that, like, so uh, we just looked at the microscope and the PowerPoint, but we can see that this one's slightly different because this object starts very, very far away. So it kind of uses uh, eyepieces that are at different, or these lenses at different focal lengths. Okay, so here's the same one that we just talked about with a compounding light microscope. A compound light microscope uses two converging lenses to create a highly magnified image. The two lenses are called the objective lens and eyepiece lens. The lens closest to the object is called the objective lens. The object being examined is located at a distance of between one and two focal lengths from the lens. At this location, the objective lens forms a real image of the object near the eyepiece lens. The image is located within the focal length of the eyepiece lens. Because the image is within the focal length of the eyepiece lens, the eyepiece lens produces an enlarged virtual image of the first image. The two lenses produce a greatly magnified virtual image of the object. Magnifications of a thousand times are common in compound light microscopes. Okay, so hopefully that gave you a good idea of how, how these combining lenses work. It's pretty fascinating stuff. Okay. Now there's another application that's seen that has really big applications. Okay, uh, it's called total internal reflection. Okay, total internal reflection occurs only if your a light is traveling from a more optically dense medium to a less opti optically dense medium. And then it occurs when the angle uh, makes it so you can't re uh, refract through it. Okay, so, um, and this occurs when your angle, okay, when your angle is greater than your critical angle. Right, when your angle is greater than your critical angle, and we'll talk about what that means real quick. So look at this uh, this ray. Okay, it's coming through. It's perpendicular. Okay, and then we move it again, so it passes through. It gets refracted just like we'd expect. It's speeding up, so it's going to be bending away from this normal. Okay, and our normal would be like this, right? Right there, like that. So it's bending away from that normal. Here, it's bending away from that normal even more because we're, you know, we're at a steeper angle. And eventually, you reach this point called the critical angle, where it doesn't get refracted at all. It just kind of skitters right across the surface. And anything past that, okay, this object gets bounced back into the uh, the medium. It can't refract through it. It gets reflected completely. And so we use this all the time, especially in fiber optics. Okay, right angle prisms and diamond cutting. Okay, fiber optics. Uh, so if you've got uh, you know fiber internet, okay, like Google Fiber and stuff like that, this is essentially what it uses. You use like these little light permeable, uh, you know, plastics or you know crystals that let the a light that in this light is actually transmitting your internet data through it. Okay, uh, optical fibers or optical cables for like sound systems. Okay, also use this kind of thing too. Okay, uh, fiber optics has been around for decades, but specifically using it for actual information processing in mass media is pretty pretty new, pretty fascinating stuff. So here's a fiber opti a fiber optic on a grand scale here. In this picture, we've got a uh, you know he's got a, like a laser beam right here, okay, and it's shining through this plastic, okay, and because he's at the critical angle, past the critical angle, it's not leaving. We can see it kind of glancing off a little bit just because I think there's some scratches and stuff. It's not quite a pure fiber optic and you can notice here at the end it comes out glowing just as bright and green as it did when it started off here and really there's not much that came out the other side okay so what is this critical angle well it's actually pretty easy to calculate the critical angle is simply the sine of the theta uh, the sine of the critical angle okay is equal to nr over ni 
okay? And ni always has to be bigger than nr, and that makes sense because you can't take the sine of uh, bigger than one anyway. So, um, so your th critical angle occurs when the angle in the less dense medium is 90 degrees to the normal. Okay, so that at the critical angle, the emerging ray travels along its surface, and then any greater angles, the rays are totally internally reflected. So let's do some practice problems here. Okay, it says find the critical angle for light emerging from a diamond into air. The index of refraction for diamond is 2.419. Okay, repeat for cubic zirconium. So we just said that sine of the critical angle is equal to nr over ni. Okay, so that means our critical angle would be equal to critical angle would be equal to the inverse sine of nr over ni. So in order to do this, for both of these, we would just have to take um, the, so for the for diamond, we'd simply take the, uh, it's going into air, so this is essentially 1.000, and then like 295 or something like that, and then uh, 2.419 for the diamond, okay? If we plug that in, we should get something closer to that, 24.42, just double check here. Of one divided by two point four one nine. Yep, twenty four point four two. And then uh, if we do the same thing for cubic zirconium, we just you know plug in uh, instead of two point four one nine, we use two point two zero zero. So if we take a uh, sine inverse of two point two inverse we get 27.04, okay? And so uh, we've got these two, and so those would be the critical angles. So if you were trying to figure out, well, what angle would not allow this light to refract out if it's traveling from diamond into air, okay? You would have to do it at greater than 24.42 or 27.04, all right? All right, and this is the next question. It says, which material is more likely to trap light entering the top surface in such a way that it reflects many times e internally before emerging? Hmm. <clears throat> so I would say that the one that has the less critical angle would be the one that would have the most likely to uh, bounce it around internally. So that would be the diamond at 24.42 because it's not it doesn't have to be as much of an extreme. And using this critical angle is one way that jewelers are able to determine uh, whether or not something's a diamond or something's cubic zirconium. Last thing here is we talk about dispersion and this is essentially how prisms work. All right, white light enters a prism and it turns out, you know, we know from before, we talked about several parts ago, that white light is made up of all the cover, colors of the rainbow, right? And so, and we know that all those different colors are essentially just different wavelengths of light, okay? And this refraction that occurs within this prism occurs based on the, uh, the, the wavelength. Okay, so the refraction depends on the wavelength. And it turns out that longer wavelengths refract less than shorter wavelengths. Okay, and so you know, so our prism when it comes in here, it, come, it bounces in, and red is much longer, so it gets uh, it gets uh, refracted less from the normal than the red light did or the red light gets reflected more than the blue light. So the one that gets reflected the most would always be the one with the highest wavelength would be uh, always be violet, right? That's the last one. And red would always be the one that gets refracted less. And this is essentially why we get rainbows through a prism or through rain, okay? Uh, chromatic aberration, this is an interesting effect that happens in certain lenses and where different colors focus at different points, okay? And so if you have a lens that has a chromatic aberration in it, all right, then what occurs is that your purples actually get, uh, have a different focal point than your reds, all right? It's pretty fascinating, all right? So that's it for our notes. That's it for part seven. You did it, I'm proud of you. Do your practice problems. Let me know if you have any questions and I'll see you on the flip side.